Well, you are all most welcome to this next part of our conversation today, which is again the live Q&A with Stuart. Now, for those of you who were here yesterday, of course, you know exactly what happens at this stage. Right now is when there is going a, a panel is going to appear on the right hand side there and where you can post in your questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see the questions live as they appear right in here into me. And then I'm going to put them to Stuart who remains on the line with us right here. So I can just see now the people are starting to come through right here. Great that you've all arrived here into this second part of our conversation with Stuart this morning. So I know that, you know, sometimes when it takes, when we have to move off one link and move on to another, it just takes takes a moment or two for, for your system to update and so on like that. So that's completely fine. We know that, that all of that is happening and I'm keeping an eye here to see that everybody is coming through. So just again, to those people who have just joined in and just joined us now in the second part of our conversation here with Stuart, the, you can put your questions in up there on the right hand side and I'm going to see them as we uh, as they appear in here and I'm going to put them to Stuart. Now, in addition, and I see that the questions have already started coming in there and that is super and please do keep keep them coming because that this is, of course, um, the, the opportunity that you have to put your questions directly to him. A couple of things that I want to mention. Number one is please do keep tweeting on hashtag ambition to scale. I've seen a couple of people uh, tweeting there already this morning. I see Mark's, uh, Mark Sterrett and I says hashtag ambition to scale with a cup of coffee again this morning with Susan Hayes and Sherry Katu. Uh, delighted that, that you're here, Mark. Um, Mary, Mary McKenna, who, of course, many of you would have met yesterday. Um, Mary here, uh, she's quoting one, a, a number of Sher Sherry's points, but she said, for example, there are so many problems out there that you might as well solve big ones. She said uh, Sherry Katu is now talking about providing short, stackable online courses for reskilling adults. So maybe Sherry learned something from me, too. Brilliant, Mary. And so keep, please do indeed keep them coming. Like we said to you yesterday, uh, this is a great opportunity to be online networking at the moment, as well as engaging with all of the content that's going on. One last thing before I start taking uh, questions in, and as I say, they're on the right hand side there of your panel, is we recorded a LinkedIn summary yesterday of all the of all of the content that happened, including Pierce Linney in the morning, when then we had Stuart Harvey from Detactics, then we had Gary Davidson from Tech Nation, we had Mary McKenna from Awaken Up, and we had Elaine Smith from Catalyst. All of those uh, LinkedIn summaries, they're now available on the Invest Northern Ireland LinkedIn page. It's on Su Susan Nightingale's page as well from British Business Bank. And also, you'll also be able to see it on Patrick Dewar's page as well on Intertrade Ireland. OK, so now, now that we're all caught up and I feel I get a sense now that everyone's in. OK, we're all good to go. OK, Stuart. Um, first question here that I'm going to put to you actually comes in from Mary McKenna, who was on the panel discussion yesterday. Mary's question is, are there are sorry? Are there any instances where you haven't taken an investor's money, Stuart? And if so, what were the reasons? Um, hi, good morning, Susan. Um, I, I I think it's not true that um, I've been involved in a situation where a company, you know, has submitted a business plan. We've looked for growth equity, and at the end, um, you know, we've we have. Um, canned the project and gone back to sort of organic growth. Usually by the time you get, to, you know, you, you're done with that business planning process, um, you've made a, a commitment to go with that as your strategy. We, we certainly have, um, both my time into tactics and other companies that I've been involved with, been quite discerning about, um, a, a, about the type of investors that, that we've gone with. And I think, you know, we've looked towards companies that have domain expertise, um, ideally um, could plug us into a network um, for strategic partnerships for, you know, for business, um, but are also, uh, well, you know, sort of thinking strongly about what happens at the next stage, whether that next stage is, is another round or potentially an exit. So I, I that, that, you know, that is the, you know, I've, I've certainly been involved in that situation many, many times. Well, you know what I think, Stuart, to pick up on, on that point about discernment of your investors, I mean, you know, a, a point you've already made is about getting away from the flattery of the whole idea of people giving, you know, giving you the attention of where they might be interested in your company and to discern whether it's the right fit, a point, a point that, that you've made now a couple of times. But can I ask you one question, actually, that came up in the panel dis discussion yesterday as a comment that I want to put to you, and that is Elaine said, she said, when investors see the potential and they see that you want to drive the ambition is that then you can actually attract 
talent and funding. Can I can I ask, because that also happened, I mean, because we often think we have to go out and seek investors. What has been your experience of the other way around? Have you attracted not well, talent and funding and investment and so on as well? Has it come to you over time? Yeah, I think you're saying, you're definitely seeing more of this in the Northern Ireland market as we become, you know, develop a reputation in fintech, reg tech, um, um, and as being a really great, you know, place to do, to do software engineering and solutions in that market. There's, there's a strong uh, degree of sort of inbound interest in London-based funds, East Coast of the US funds. Yesterday, in fact, I had a long conversation with a California-based fund that had heard about us via, I think it was Technation, um, uh, where you know they're starting to they're starting to sort of fish in, um, in this in, in this pond. I think, and I think that's very exciting. Um, uh, you know, it builds on the great work that we've done for startup capital, um, and we're we're starting to get on people's radars now. So growth equity is coming in. I think I mentioned in my talk as well uh, the advent of private equity coming. Mm -hmm. You know, co coming coming down in terms of um, check sizes that they write, you know, typically much lower than they would have done five years ago. So I think all of those things are, 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 are exciting for anybody, you know, thinking of a startup or, or, a, or, or working on a, in, in a scale up. I mean, in, in many ways, what, what you've both said, both you and Sher Sherry this morning has kind of rhymed with, if you're going to do something, do it big, or as you, in your own words, specifically have a go at it. And on that note, John has just sent in a question here, which he says, which investor, whether it's a network, a firm or an organization, would you recommend talking to if we wanted to raise Series A funding tomorrow? It, 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 it's the question, a, 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 partic a particular venture company, or is it one of those three? Uh, well, the question specifically as it comes in here is which investor, whether it's a network, a firm or an organization. So I think maybe you might interpret that, Stuart, in, in whichever way you think um, would be most appropriate, because I, I don't have any more detail here. But Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm very happy to take that offline with the questioner. You know, I, I'm, I, 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 I think you need to explore all this. It seems like not much of an answer, but you need to explore all of those. I mean, your network is going to... Is, is, <clears throat> it's going to be very important to you as you after you take investor money and you're you know you're trying to build the business you're trying to help good you're you're, you're trying to hire good people um the you know the investors themselves are going to guide you towards an exit that you're inevitably on that that sort of escalator towards an exit if you take uh if you take venture and so you want to have good partners as part of that journey as well when when you talk about you know taking the escalator and so on like that Yesterday also, Gary in Tech Nation was very, you know, very, very vocal about the importance of the peer-to-peer -peer network that's that's involved in whether it's an accelerator or also even there leading, leading back to John's point about, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer network within a company or even within other like this conference, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer network that is establishing here between even the speakers. What's been your experience, Stuart, of having that having that network to go to far insight who've walked the walk or maybe have different perspective or like even in your own offer there to take the question offline, how important has that peer to peer network been for you? Well, I, I, I think it's invaluable. Um, I think we're doing a better job here. Um, again, in Northern Ireland in building these networks, you know, um, peers, whether they're at the sort of CTO level um, or the, you know, the CEO level. Um, I, it is good to, it can be, you know, it can be quite lonely in any of those roles. It can be very challenging. And um, you're doing a lot of stuff for the first time um, and have, you know, having to fly by the seat of your pants, which is great. You know, it's, it's great to be able to meet a person for a cup of coffee and, and, and just have honest warts and all conversations about, about, about these, you know, about these matters. And on that note, and it's the last question where we're going to have time to put to you today, Stuart. This question comes in from Paul. Stuart, if a company just wants mentorship or an advisor, where should they go looking? Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I, my experience, my most local experience will, will have been through the ecosystem that exists at Catalyst. Um, uh, I, I, there, there are other bodies here in Northern Ireland, but I find that an excellent um, source of uh, you know, heading up a relationship with potentially with a co-founder. Um, Cal is very well plugged into the whole, the international um, growth equity scene. They, they run a lot of very interesting courses about everything from, 
you know, fundraising to uh, to writing a business plan. And, and I, I, th I think you don't go far wrong when you when you engage with the guys at Capitals. Brilliant. Well, Stuart, it has been my absolute pleasure getting to know you over the past two days. I know that you've shared really, really interesting content that we've got a lot of feedback on to say that it's been very interesting and insightful and practical and directional. So we truly wish you and all of the team at the Tactics every best wish in the future. And thank you for being with us here on both days. My pleasure. Thank you, Susan. Bye. Thank you indeed. So now what we're going to now do as we move into our first panel discussion today, where I'm going to introduce to you two fantastic people. Before I do that, though, can I ask the team back at HQ to now run the next poll? So this is where we're now going to ask you one more question, and that is, have you considered or explored the possibility of raising equity finance before. So we've already heard your thoughts, which I'm going to put to the panel, by the way. We've already heard, heard your thoughts about how important you think it is. But now we would just like to hear in terms of action, where do you stand? Okay, so that poll has now been opened. And I can see now that it has been open and that it's up and running now. We're almost coming up there to 10 seconds. Okay, just going to let this run because I know based on yesterday, we have had at least half of the people participating in those polls. So just going to let that run there now for another couple of... Another couple of seconds, and then uh, we are going to close it. So I'm just going to give it another five, four, three, two, one. Okay, can I just close the poll, please? I'll close the poll. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Can, I just have to say, honest to good God, <laughs> the people in the background here that we're working with, there's too many of them to actually name, and I don't want to do it in case I get into I get into trouble for missing out on somebody. But I just have to tell you, they're absolute legends. They really are. Every single thing that you see happening here, they make my job most enjoyable and very easy and such a great pair of hands. So thank you very much indeed to, to the people here in the background. OK, so now what I'm going to do is that I am going to now ask um, I'm going to now int introduce to you two really, really wonderful and most accomplished people and who they are. I'm just going to make sure that they're on our screen here and good to go. OK, perfect. So uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to introduce you Kerry Baldwin at IQ Capital and Neil McGowan at MML Capital. So first and foremost, Kerry, can you tell us a little bit about you and IQ Capital in order to get our ball rolling today? Yeah, thank you, Susan. I'm delighted to be here today and join you all and uh, hopefully offer some founders some really good advice on if they're considering venture capital. So I'm the co-founder and managing partner of IQ Capital Partners, and I'm the chair of the BBCA. I've been in venture capital since 1998, so I've met thousands of founders and their teams over that time. IQ Capital, we invest in early stage, seed and series A in deep tech, really IP rich companies. We're seeking bold ambition to become category leaders in your field. And then we're able to back and support our founders with a growth fund for our Series B and Series C outperforming companies. We're based in Cambridge and London, but we invest all across the UK. And you'll probably find us and most of our team lurking in universities and looking at really tech ecosystems. And what I really look for is that founder connection, but we might touch on that later. Brilliant, Kerry. And I have to say, I think it's it's uh, it's interesting to hear you mention lurking in a university. <laughs> indeed, my, my my first and only time being in Cambridge was in one indeed. So we're certainly looking forward to hear, hearing a lot more about that and about the university connection. Neil, let's go to you. Could you tell us a little bit about MML, please? Sure. And uh, thanks, Susan. And like Kerry, I'm delighted to be here today. And hopefully I can uh, uh, share something of value with the, the audience. Um, so MML is probably at the opposite end of the spectrum to Kerry's firm. Um, we're a, a later stage investor in private equity. Um, uh, MML Ireland is a dedicated fund uh, um, uh, for investing in Irish SMEs across the island of Ireland. Um, we've been doing this since uh, late 2013. I have about 13 years of investing experience myself and, and, and previously was involved in investment banking. So, so what does that mean? Typically for us, that means investing in businesses that are Earnings positive, in fact, uh, doing about a million euros or sterling um, in EBITDA. Um, ticket sizes of between five and 20 million euros um, in investment or, or, or equivalent in, in sterling. Uh, we're investing out of a 145 million euro fund. And, and as I said, we're, we're kind of the opposite of carry in the sector. We're not sector specialists at all. So deep tech would send shivers down the back of my spine, uh, to be honest with you, not in a bad way, but it's just not something that I understand uh, or is it part of our investment strategy. So as I said, sector generalist means for us, we invest in business services, healthcare, engineering services or products, uh, outsourcing products or services, 
um, and select consumer um, opportunities. That's us. Perfect, Neil. And it's it's interesting. And, and I will just just clarify for clarifying this. So specifically, what you're looking for is earnings positive. In other words, a company that's profitable, a million plus of EBITDA. And and just in case anybody isn't familiar with that term, because I I do know that this that this world of finance can often be you know laden with acronyms. So EBITDA is earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. Now, yeah, in essence, it. that is. Um, it's an accounting term, really. It's basically looking at the real cash, cash based profit that, that you have uh, built in there. So in essence, that's that's what it is. But it's a term that can often be used in any type of finance. So that's EBITDA. And again, Neil, I just want to be very, very sure about this. You said, is it between five and 20 million? Of, of equity, yes. Five, right. five and 20 million of equity. Yes. OK, brilliant. OK, so now that now that we know who both of you are, I just want to let you know the the answer to the first poll that we ran this morning. Bear in mind to you both, as I know that you know this is day two, but I just want to give you the context that yesterday um, we saw really big change in the polls between running them in the morning before the speakers and panellists and then in the afternoon. So the question that we asked this morning is, how aware are you of the range of alternative non-bank funding options available to scaling businesses? 16% said no awareness, 53% said some awareness, and 32% said good awareness. And we define good awareness as being able to name five plus. Um, may, uh, Kerry, could maybe I go to you? What's your reaction to that, first and foremost? I think that's why these um, panels are really important and these conferences are really important. So really uh, making founders understand what are the options available and what are they? And exactly as you're doing, saying what sort of fund is suitable or what sort of super angel is really suitable? So if you're very early in your process, you might be looking at a really experienced sector angel that can help you with your early product market fit and thinking about your proposition, or you might go on to venture, or as you say, you fit the criteria for a later stage investment such as Neil's, then you can go that way. But I think one of the things that we'll touch on throughout today is really looking at that. But the fact that the, the, so there is more than some awareness is a good start, which shows that Northern Ireland is doing a lot in that direction. And Kerry, just like I did there with, with Neil, and Neil, I'm going to go to you for the, your reaction to that poll as well. But before I do, Kerry, um, can, I, can I just ask you, you know, Neil was very clear there about the kind of the parameters of what he's looking for, but you said bold ambition, um, but you specifically said founder connection. What, what is founder connection? Founder connection is just really, really important. So for a founder, you get to choose what type of capital and investors will back you for your journey. So when you go into a private, let's say we start with angels. If you go into an angel and you just connect and that angel is able to say, yes, I've sold a business in this sector. These are the things that I found. These are the things that you would need to watch out for. It's such really brilliant advice as you're setting up and thinking about your proposition. Find a connection when you come to venture. There are lots of different funds, lots of funds. There are generalist funds. There are sector specific funds. There are funds that are for SaaS software. There are funds that are just purely fintech. There are funds that are just hardware. What you're looking for is saying, what do I actually need help with right at this moment? And you go into that fund and the founder connection is when you have a conversation with a VC and they just get you. They get your thinking. They understand your problems. They've seen those problems before, how to tackle that route. They've got connections. They're probably making connections even before they've issued a term sheet. And a founder connection means that Alongside that journey, as you're growing and scaling, there's going to be things that you're encountering for the very first time. And you want to make sure that alongside you, you've got a partner that understands your sector, understands how to get through those problems. And you've got a really strong connection as a sounding board when you're thinking about getting through problems. You don't always come to a venture capitalist and say, I've got the solution. A good venture capital founder connection is when you're talking together and just thinking through problems. That would be my summary of founder connection. And it's vital to all the founders listening. Um, well, Kerry, if there was ever an award for passion for their subject, <laughs> I think you're up for a BAFTA. I really do. You you really you really do in, encapsulate what what that founder connection uh, certainly is. Neil, what's your reaction? Is that really? I mean, fifty three percent, which is the biggest answer here, has said they've had some awareness of alternative or non bank funding options available to scaling business. Uh, what's your reaction to that? I think it's a positive um, uh, answer. I mean, I think the direction of travel is probably more important actually, um, and I think that. Uh, increasing awareness, as Kerry said, through media media like this and, and uh, in-person events. 
so that people can understand um, what it is to have an outside investor in your business. Um, because there's a, there's a, there's, there's a uh, I suppose, a, a fear factor there for, for a lot of people. And one of the things that we found, I suppose we started, as I said, in 2013, there was a cohort of kind of later stage investors kind of came on the scene in the island of Ireland for the first time. But it was hard to get the message across in the early days about what we were and what we weren't. And to be honest with you, distinguishing between private equity and say the media narrative of ultra funds buying property from some of the distressed banks um, because there was a bit of tarring with the same brush. And actually now, if you roll that forward, in my category of investing, I suppose, across the island, there's probably been 50 or 60 um, uh, investee companies that have taken our type of capital. And that's 50 or 60 alumni, effectively, or entrepreneurs or owners of businesses that can hopefully have a, a, a good thing to say about that. Um, and so it's much much easier for, for a founder or owner of a business to talk to a peer um, that has been through the experience before and, and relates to it um, rather than hearing kind of what it means in theory from from the likes of me or or, or, or an advisor. So I, I think I think that I, I think that the answer to the flirt survey is very positive, um, but we need to continue to build awareness. And you know, Neil, like so often we're hearing that that focus on the peer to peer network and understanding who's who. And I have to say, in you know, in great credit to the British Business Bank and Intertrade Ireland and Invest Northern Ireland, I mean, they, they had over 300 people at their event in, in 2019. In 2020, they cancelled it because of, of what was happening. And of course, this year in, in 2021, it's gone ahead and they're certainly planning for the, for the event to happen in 2022 because the importance, and you're both saying this, not, not just Neil, Kerry saying it as well, you're both saying this is that the awareness and the nuance of this conversation is, is very, very important. So now I'm going to tell you about the answer to the second poll. And again, I'm going to go, I'm going to, go to both of you for, for your reaction to that. And please do it. Like I say, the question, the questions panel is open. That's why we've moved you into this space. Please do send them in, please. And thank you. OK, so can I now tell you that the question was, how important do you think equity or alternative finance is when it comes to scaling business? Interestingly, our audience, zero percent of them said not very important. Thirty four percent of people said important. And 66, two out of every three people who answered the poll said very important. Kerry, back to you. Yes, and that would make sense. If you're looking to scale, then you need to have some funding to actually invest as you're, especially at my end of the market, when you may not have lots of revenues. You're looking to invest in a team. You're looking to attract the very best talent. You're looking to really understand and, and really speak with your customers and get as much market intelligence as you're building your product. And for that, you need funding alongside you in order to attract the most talent and have the right tools and experience within your team. So, yes, that would make sense. And of course, Kerry, I'm just paraphrasing what you've just said there. Money isn't just financial, is it? Money is also the, the non-monetary benefits as well of, of that investment. Absolutely vital. Absolutely vital. It's the connections that funds can make for you. It's where they've seen uh, other other um, portfolio companies selling into the same companies. And we at IQ Capital are no different to lots of other funds. We have lots of portfolio companies built up over the last sort of 20 years. And what we're able to do is we're able to match as other funds are we're able to match those very early stage companies with our later stage companies who've surmounted those problems so if we've got somebody looking at should i be a product-led company with a marketing plan or should i be an abm strategy with the marketing plan we're able to put them in touch with experts who've gone through the series b gone through the series c funding and say okay this is how we thought about the marketing when we were at your stage and a lot of funds do this and this is part of what we call value add but we can touch on that and that is really important and it's also really important for founders to test this as you engage with a vc ask for references, ask to speak to their other CEOs, say, what was the experience with that fund? Did they really unlock customer introductions? Did they really unlock their portfolio and other people for you uh, to draw experience upon? These are very important questions to be asking during the process. Perfect. And uh, in a similar way, I suppose, to how people might apply for a job or apply for a PhD or anything else is that there's that product market fit in, in another direction as well. And um, Neil, what's your reaction to that to that poll? 66 percent of people feel that equity or alternative finance is very important. Again, very encouraging. Um, I mean, I, I think um, diversity of finance appropriate capital structure for the stage of a company's development is, is critical. And people can be lured into debt finance very easily by the low rates, um, but you know, you know that it, it comes with um, responsibilities. You have to pay it back. Banks typically want their money back fairly, fairly quickly after they lend it to you. 
um, uh, but it has a, a time and a place in the company's evolution. So it's it, it's basically matching your your capital structure to meet the stage of development that you're at. As Kerry said, and I fully agree, businesses are looking to scale and grow, um, um, either no or, or or low levels of debt are, are more appropriate. If you're a later stage company. Um, with the contractual underpinning from your, your customer base and revenue, then yeah, debt, debt, debt is, is, is an appropriate form of finance, to a, but to a level. I think um, there was some very interesting research done by Intertrade in the early part of the last decade, surveying uh, companies north and south about what their diversity of funding was. And I think it was 94% or thereabouts of, of companies were relying on debt finance. And even within that, a lot of it was um, uh, not contracted, if you like, so it was overdraft rather than term debt facility. I think I'd, I'd like to think anyway that the diversity of, fund, diversity of funding across the island has improved immeasurably since those days and it, just after the, the, the global financial crisis. Do you think is that part of maybe a, you know, a, a finance maturity in Ireland? Across, and I mean across the island of Ireland when you're referring to Intertrade, do you think that comes from more awareness? Do you think from is there more physical money? Do you think is there more ambition? Why has that happened? Particularly, you've been buying that since the financial crisis. I mean, you know, that's a, it's a it's a it's a good benchmark. But I'm just wondering what's changed, Neil. I think people remember and saw what happened during the financial crisis and the consequences of, of over, over um, um, concentration on, on on debt as a form of financing. I mean, just because a, a bank is prepared to lend to a certain level doesn't mean that that's the right thing for the business. And I think owners are are starting to see that. And obviously, as well, availability of different forms of finance is a key factor. There, you know, that, that that diversity was not there in, in the early part of the last decade. And that research, I suppose, uh, triggered some, some policy changes, both north and south, to, to facilitate greater funding diversity. Uh, that's there now. Uh, and as I said, the more companies that avail of that diversity, different types of financing that's available, the more it'll, it, it will continue to grow. Neil, is it growing in terms of amount or nuance or both? I think it's both. Right. Okay. Okay. And and let's now really hone in here on Northern Ireland itself, because I'm just have to get a question in here from Mary um, McKenna and and Kerry. I'm aware that you've invested in companies in Northern Ireland, so I'd just like to particularly put this question to you. Mary says really enjoyed joining this panelist session and especially listening to Kerry talk about founder connection. My question to Kerry is: Is IQ Capital interested in making seed stage investments in Northern Ireland? Yes, we are. And we have done. So, yes, Northern Ireland is a really interesting ecosystem for us. You've got fantastic talent. You've got some really strong uh, deep tech propositions and it's a good ecosystem that's developing. You're strong in med tech, health tech, fintech. You've got your cyber security center of excellence. You know, you've got some really good grant funding as well from Invest NI that really supports businesses. So what we look at is we look at uh, companies, um, from this ecosystem. And we've seen many companies uh, in the ecosystem, especially across the fields I've mentioned earlier. And we made an investment uh, recently, we led the round for Neurovalence, which is a med tech company, uh, a neurotech company uh, tackling really large uh, problems such as obesity and, and type two diabetes. But there are lots of other companies that we've looked at in this ecosystem. So yes, we do invest, we invest at seed and series A. So yes, please do get in touch. Um, but we've been really impressed with what we've seen in, in your ecosystem. And the you, you mentioned there the sector specific elements of what you see in Northern Ireland, Kerry. You also talk about the, the grant funding and the ecosystem indeed um, of Northern Ireland. What do you, is there any other specific characteristics that you would spot in the Northern Irish, either the, the character, whether it's the people, whether it's the ambition, whether it's the ability to make connections, whether it is the technology in the labs, what else would you characterize in Northern Ireland, particularly since we have a very specific audience here with us today? Yeah, I think that it's a combination of all of those. You've got two very, really, well, some very strong propositions coming out of your universities. Um, you've got some strong business angels, but I think you could probably do with getting more um, sector experience mentors that could come in. Now, now we've had this year where we've all been well, first of all, we all had to figure out how to make remote investments, but now we've all got comfortable with interacting with companies remotely. There's um, every opportunity for founders to be connecting with mentors that don't necessarily come from your region, but you can connect into different ecosystems. For example, my fund set itself up in Cambridge, we're obviously a London-based fund as well, but we set ourselves and our roots in Cambridge. Why? We had similar things to Northern Ireland. We had a really strong university at the core with really strong R&D. 
We then saw the influx of lots of corporate R&D research centres, and there's over 250 of those. We also had really big exits in that uh, inside Cambridge. And what came from those exits were, were really strong business mentors that are able to go in and really start helping this new generation of companies, uh, both with capital and with experience. And I think that is something that you could probably do with um, trying to address getting more mentors from outside your ecosystem specific to certain problems that you're looking at um, over time. But in terms of the raw talent and technology, it's all in Northern Ireland in those sectors that I've outlined. And I'm sure there's lots of other sectors. I know that you're really strong in advanced materials and engineering as well, but I haven't made an investment in those fields yet, yet. Oh, and that sounds promising, Kerry. It, it, it certainly does. And can I now go to you, please, on this, on this need? Because, you know, today is all about ambition to scale. That is the hashtag, which I encourage you to keep tweeting on. It is the, the theme of today's conference. So what do you think is the importance of ambition and big vision? I mean, I think ambition is, is critical um, uh, for a business looking to take on equity at any stage, um, to be honest with you, because, uh, you know, a fund investing in a business is, 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 is clearly looking for a return. Um, that return is, is driven from the performance of the business and the management team that are driving that performance. And so they have to have the ambition to achieve it. For us investing at the, at the later stage, a lot of the time, um, risk appetite among the shareholder base has constrained ambition to an extent. Um, and most of the investments that we've made have uh, provided shareholder liquidity, either to management, you are continuing with the business, and then can, I suppose, increase their risk appetite because they de risked their own personal um, lives and position, or because there may be outside shareholders or shareholders who, who have uh, moved on from a managerial position in a business who are um, uh, uh, more conservative when it comes to where the company should be going in the future. But risk and, uh, and, and ambition are two sides of the same coin for us. Uh, to the extent that you can uh, uh, de-risk uh, shareholders and management in a business to an extent, you can unlock amb ambition. And that is a key form of growth for us at our end of the spectrum. And how, how do you know if you're being ambitious enough, Neil? And like my ambition over the years, I mean, I've, I've, been, a, I've been a founder now for, for 11 years and started numerous, I, numerous brands and startups and so on. And, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And I've often found when I've been on trade missions, let's say in various parts of America or, or other parts of the world generally, even being exposed to, to content like this and get an understanding of, you know, can you go for those checks for 5 million? In fact, can you go for those checks of 10 million? How do you know when your ambition is big enough? Or maybe if I put this another way, how do you boost your ambition? Um, well, I, I, I think a lot of business, I think a lot of businesses in Ireland and Northern Ireland in particular probably look out uh, earlier than a lot of company, companies would in, in bigger markets. And so um, to be honest with you, I, we, we don't find, we don't, what we're looking at in the businesses that we see don't tend to lack for ambition. Um, what they tend to lack is maybe the confidence to, to pursue that ambition and um, the kind of tools to do it. And, and I, I suppose I'm talking in particular about internationalization um, and, and the ability and experience to take that, that step into a new, mar new market or potentially a new product in a new market. And that's where we can help, as I said, with, with capital, with experience, with network, um, in, in a similar way to, to, to Kerry mentioned in, in, in relation to venture capital. So, I, um, I suppose I haven't found businesses lacking for ambition. Sometimes they're not 100% sure about what the next step is to, to, to actually fulfil it. And before I go back to Kerry and Neilan, a question has come in as well that I, I'm going to put to Kerry. But the, the other question that I'd like to just ask you is, how do you see ambition manifesting itself in the companies that pitch to you? What, what's, your, you know, what's your flag for it? And, and also, how do you know that, the, that it's not just confidence is, in terms of, of execution is the issue as distinct from saying one thing and being willing to do another? Was that to me, Susan? Yes, yes indeed, Neil, yes. Well, I think experience, and, and Kerry was talking earlier on about founder connection, um, like you, you, part of the investment process and, and meeting businesses is building a connection with the, the founder and driving force in, in, in the business. And, and you know, you, you're learning about their, their drive and ambition, and I suppose you're assessing their ability to achieve that um, uh, with, with support. I mean, that's, part of, that's what the investment process is really for us. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And 
now Kerry, can I can I bring this this back back to you? Is this whole conversation again around around ambition? I mean, as Neil says there, number one is that it's it's not lacking. Number two, the issue may not be ambition but confidence. And number three is that the support mechanism offered by a fund um, or offered by by an investor can certainly help that along the way. Can I just ask you maybe to, to comment on that as well? What do you see out there? Do you see any difference between ambition, confidence, ability? I think that we have to look at the different stages. So at seed, you're often selling your vision, where you want to go. You don't necessarily have metrics uh, or anything like this to underpin your investment. It's saying, I want to become a category leader, which means I want to become a company that is has the potential with my technology to be completely global and used by lots and lots of companies, be it small companies, large companies, whatever your proposition is. So you have to see that ambition very, very early on uh, for a venture capital to, to, to make an investment in that sector. And then by series A, you're expected to have repeatable sales. You're expected to start to be formulating. You've you found your product market fit or you're still finding your product market fit, but you're kind of closer to that product market fit. And then from series B onwards, your metrics. So you really understand that this is how your business works, how your lead gen works, how you can close sales. You, you've got sales playbooks. But at that early end, when I'm investing, first of all, we are looking at that vision. And to really underpin that vision and why it's not just confidence, it means that you're really demonstrating to the, the venture capitalist or, or the super angel, you're, you're demonstrating, you understand your market and how you fit within the wider market globally. What other tools are right there? What are your competitors doing? How are your competitors pitching? Why is your product going to be the one that's going to be the one that's going to be selected and win in that category? And why is your vision going to get there? Now you do need to have a bit of ambition and you do need to have that confidence as well. Because part of being a founder, especially if, if you have those scale ambitions, is to be attracting a team. And team, you have to be able to lead and you have to be able to track talent better than you throughout the growth stages. And therefore, you do need to have that confidence. But what you're also doing is setting a culture that's the right culture to instill confidence across all of your team as well. So it's not just the founder with the confidence and the ambition. Everybody's bought in with the culture of the organization for the scale and where you want to go. Kerry, what you're saying there, just to remind the audience of, of yesterday, Piers Linney uh, spoke yesterday as a dragon um, from Dragon's End in the UK. And he spoke about that idea of total addressable market really being not just a number picked out of a market research report, but a true understanding of the different markets that you have and the chances that you're going to reach them. Similarly, Stuart from the Tactics mentioned as well yesterday about that idea of market segmentation. So just to really, you know, weld all, all of that there together. The what I'd what I'd also like to, like to put to you as well. Is a big problem, Gary. And and Neil, I think it's worthwhile getting your take on this as well. Is deep down in one's core, um, as a founder myself, I can res resonate with this. Is that you, you know, a founder's created this business. Some some of us have set this up at 100 percent shareholding, some of us set this up with, with other people. Personally, I've, I've done both. And you feel that this is my baby, you know, my thing that I set up, I put in my blood, sweat, and tears, I put in my sweat equity, um, and so on, like that. And there can be this aversion to letting go of that capital for whatever reason, because it could be emotional, it could be visceral, but it could also be that afraid of an, you know, an overbearing influence coming in and doing something in, 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 in aggressive ways that might disagree with the way we run things. Or of course, there may also be feelings around handing this on to the next generation. So, and I really would appreciate both of your thoughts on that. Kerry, so what do you say? To those who want to hold on to their equity and they're worried that the wrong type of overbearing bottom line or the word you use, metrics focused influence could come onto the business if they open the door. Again, it comes back to that connection and doing your research and speaking with the funds and the other CEOs that they have invested in, in the past. You know, the good blend with a good founder and good VCs. It is a really great combination if you're wanting to go for that venture capital route. And, and it's all about that connection and how they work. And, and I think founders must be doing diligence on funds they're thinking about taking funding from, from other CEOs that are in their Series B and Series C have gone way beyond those. Take the diligence on the fund. You know, you need the funding in order to scale and grow your team and, and really meet the vision and ambition that you're having that we touched on earlier. You need that. But what's really, really important is to make sure that you've got that trust and you've got the ability to have somebody by your side 
that is not going to behave in that. I don't know venture capitalists that behave like that, if that makes sense, with their investments. It's a really collaborative investment. Metrics are important as you get to Series A and Series B, because without metrics or KPIs, you're not heading. You won't be able to raise your next round. So in the visionary stage at C, that's fine. You know, define your market. But by Series A and Series B, you, you have to be on metrics. You have to be understanding your market and how, how to interact and move your clients and everyone through the pipe. That's really important because without that, you're not going to raise your next round and your next round. But really do your research on the fund, as I've touched on several times. And, and you're a founder. You can connect with other founders very easily uh, and find out who is the right fit for you. Neil, what do you say to, to that to that very common aversion that can be there? And sometimes people don't even know that they have an aversion. They've just an assumption that it isn't for them. This audience certainly is different based on the poll results we've seen. But I just would still like to speak to that. Perhaps that is something that could be holding people back. I suppose it's trying to understand what, what's driving the aversion. And sometimes people feel that if they take on, particularly in, in, in the later stage in private equity, if they take an, a private equity investor into their business, they lose control fully and it'll be sold out from, from under them in the future. Um, I mean, that's, that's just not the case. Um, as Kerry said, people need to do their homework and do their diligence. Any fund later or early stage will do significant diligence on any investment opportunity. That needs to be reciprocal. Um, talk to the people that we've invested in, in before personally and as a fund. What are we like on a cold wet Monday morning when and we've had a maybe not so brilliant set of results coming our way on a Friday? Um, but part of it being an investor means being having taking the responsibility to understand the business and the market and what's going on so that you you, you have context for what's going on in your investment. Um, there's a responsibility with, with, that goes with that. And as regards, I think you mentioned briefly at the, at the opening uh, part of the question um, about family. I mean, it is possible that businesses are, uh, there's lots of family businesses in our and very, very successful ones that pass on the business to the next generation and, and, and never take in outside capital. That's fine. That's, that's no problem. There's, I mean, there's a whole cohort of people who will never convince um, that, that, that it's a good idea to take on investment. Um, and I, and I, that, that, that's perfectly perfectly fine. They're, 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 they're happy and they don't want to take an outside investor and they, they're planning on handing the business on from one generation to another. The, the issue, I suppose, comes with when, when, you, when um, you do need outside capital to help pass that on, to help and facilitate ownership transition, um, making sure that, that you understand what's involved and what's not involved. And I think, Neil, that what's actually very important is also what you're pointing, just the, the family business point, I think, is actually a, ver a very important one. It can often objectify some of the, the conversations that can happen in family business as well. But you mentioned there people are afraid that, this, that the business will be you know, sold out from one of them. Could you maybe demystify the process of what happens at exit? Because so far over the past day and a half, we have been talking about bringing money in. But what happens when an investor then sells on? Could you take us through what happens then? Yeah, for, from from our side, I, I can. I mean, I, it's probably slightly different in, in early stage and, and venture, but I mean, I think the first thing to say is when when um, you're talking about a fund, typically a closed ended fund, and, and basically that means it has a, a, a specific life, and the investor is going to want to exit. We're 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 a cash to cash investor. Our job is to generate a return for for our investors. It sounds obvious, but it, it's important to state that fact boldly when you're talking to to business owners and founders, and and. and but have the conversation early about everybody's intentions. You know, um, when, we, when we meet owners and founders, you try to establish time frame. Um, uh, we talked about ambition. So what's the ambition for the journey for that time frame? And wh what do we think is the most appropriate exit route? Um, we've had three exits in our fund um, uh, so far, our first fund, and all of them have been different. Um, our first investment was a business in the North called Low Rental. Um, the original proposition with Lowe was that we, we were backing uh, a 54-year-old, um, uh, not the founder of the business, but the, the guy who was running it and material shareholder. He had bought the business with two high net worth investors who effectively wanted to step off the bus. We facilitated that and we also put growth capital into the company. And Rodney, who was the CEO, said he's got, he wanted to go on a five-year journey and then we'd all exit together to a trade player. Well, guess what? Things changed, right? So two years into the journey, Rodney saw an incredible um, growth opportunity in the US that he thought was going to take another five years to really maximize. And he said, you could either come on Emmett to us, MML, we were two years in, you can either come on that journey with me, or I think actually there's an opportunity to, for us all to take some capital off the table and de-risk, and we'll go on and, and attack this big opportunity in the US. And so 
that's what we did. We 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 um, went to the market um, to see if there was anyone interested in investing in the business to facilitate this additional growth journey, and we ended up exiting at that point. Rodney took some capital off the table and continued with a new fund. So we effectively had um, done very well, but outlived our usefulness, I suppose, to to, to Low as a business, and it was appropriate that they went went on to a bigger private equity fund. Um, so, so what happened there was we defined, I suppose, a, a journey at the exit, but it changed. And you know what? What's interesting there, Neil, as well, is that when we talk about ambition to scale, it's not just about product market fit or founder connection, but actually matching the ambition of both as well, of both the the the, the investor and the and the investee. Um, Kerry, can I can I come back to come back to you about this? What what has been your experience of, of exiting, or you know, do people do investors figure out when to exit before they enter? It's a question you have to ask right at the beginning. You know, what is the motivation? Why do you want to go with this? What what is your ambition? Do you see yourself being a founder all the way through? Do you see yourself being CEO all the way through? These are questions that you you ask in your conversational DD. And obviously they change over time, but it's a conversation you must continue having. Um, I think it's really important to understand the the also, (laughs) you're probably not having a relationship with just one fund. So by the time you get to series A, series B, series C, you've probably got several VCs or investors around your board. And you need to make sure that everybody's aligned on their time frame. And I'm always um, saying to founders, make sure you're asking the fund which vintage fund they're investing out of. So it's if, if everyone's so what that means is making sure that if I'm investing out of my 2019 fund, I've got 10 years or so to exit that company. But if I'm investing on, out of a 2015 fund, then I've got uh, uh, I need to get to an exit earlier. And it's really important for founders to make sure that those vintages of funds are aligned because then you've got that, uh, then you know that all of your investors are all on the same journey. Now, liquidity is something that's really important for founders as well. And often, and we're seeing more and more of this at Series B and beyond, sometimes as early as Series A, some of the founders being able to sell a little bit of their stake to take away the pressure where they funded this company and they've, you know, it enables them to buy their house or buy their flat or just to just take some pressure from some of the, the debts they've had to set up the company. We're seeing more and more of that. And, and then most funds are really supportive to, to, to doing that. But the most important thing is, what do you want? You know, the government has a, a you know, is really, really supportive of technology uh, for, for, the, for the UK and the science superpower. They want ambitious founders to go all the way through, you know, right through with all of the, 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 the right through to listing, as we've seen from some of the reviews and some of the companies that are listing. And we need to be supportive of founders that want to go onto that, that route. But it's really, really important to just have that conversation all the time. You know, where are we going? When are we exiting? And another problem is a lot of companies um, exiting too early because an offer comes along. You know, we've got such great technologies in this country and it's people are saying, oh, you can sell out now for 100 million or 200 million. And it's just really understanding why do you want to do that? Now, benefits of come some companies that have sold out early, probably for those sort of companies that were never going to go on and scale and become category leaders. But what it enables them to do and what we see all of the time is them coming back with their second uh, venture. And then that second company ends up scaling faster and you get repeatable, repeatable. And then you get this sort of building of an ecosystem where those founders are just giving back, giving back. And that's too, but it's so important to check the alignment on exit as you go in, especially as you get to series B and C and beyond. Yeah, I mean, both of you are so consistent on that point. Uh, you really, really are. And I think that's something that we we definitely need to take away from this conversation. Kevin just uh, sends in a, a point here. He says, great point on vintage funds, making sure how long you have as a founder to exit. Um, I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of our panel discussion here. So I'm just going to put uh, two more questions to you both. First one here comes in from Patrick, and this is, I'm interested to hear the panel's view on green and clean investment and the focus on net zero carbon reduction. He goes on to say, and how the climate emergency is shaping their investment decisions and considerations. Um, Neil, we might start with you on that. Yeah, so, I mean, I I suppose ESG, or what what, what we mean by ESG is environmental, social and and governance factors are... um, have become more and more important um, for, for, for investors, both public and private market investors, for two reasons. One is the people who give us money are putting pressure on us. And because it makes sense, um, it, it's, the, it's the direction of travel for, for the globe. We need to, to be looking at these things, particularly on the, on the climate side. Um, and it, 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 
to generate stronger returns. So uh, ESG is not just about environment, but it's about uh, all sorts of other aspects in terms of, you know, labor. It's uh, it you know it's it's about labor standards, as I said. It's about uh, gender equality. It's you know all of those things come come into it, um, um, and it is becoming more and more crucial uh, for all sorts of investing. So do you mean in terms of the investment propositions themselves are in that space or do you mean the investment Both. propositions are incorporate ESG factors into their considerations of simply operating? Both, 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 both. both. Okay. both. And I mean, so every, every investment that we look at, we look at through an ESG lens, irrespective of oh. what sector it's in. Okay, okay. Every investment you look at as an ESG lens. If I was, if I was, if I wasn't doing this job, that's something I would be tweeting right now. I can tell you. Um, Kerry, can I just get your your thoughts on that before I ask you your fi- the final question to wrap up this conversation? Yes, I agree. It's a really important factor, and it's increasingly important. The BBCA has been publishing and writing about this since 2010 with its members, and private equity is actually incredibly strong in this area. Um, When we look at it from our lens in venture, we have to look at what is possible within our early stage companies in terms of what we can report on and how we think about things. So illustrations of social include sort of parental uh, policies, you know, measuring increasing diversity in in your workforce and diversity of thought. Um, And then when you come onto that governance side of things, it's, it's the it's really looking at the sort of cyber resilience, sort of board oversight, pay and gaps and health and safety. It's really, really important, especially in this year of COP26. And again, the government really, really strong in that 10 point plan again and really looking to, to, to invest and just really promote all of the technologies that are throughout the whole UK that are addressing green issues. And we're seeing more and more funds being raised. Uh, targeting this area as well and, and addressing this area, which is a good sign. But yeah, we too at a, at a VC have in our investment papers ESG and we monitor every single investment on the ESG as it comes through. And I think in venture, you'll see more and more of that. But private equity has been really, really strong in this field. I, I remember filling out an application a couple of years ago for uh, what was then a Horizon 2020 project. And one of the questions was, how is your proposition going to aid the sustainable development goals? And it was it had the same like and if the, if that if that was blank, it just wasn't going to be accepted, even get get looked at. So I, I but I think it's important to refine here again what both Kerry and Need are saying is that it's both investments in the space that can solve a problem as well as operationally uh, looking at how the business is run. OK, so my last question is. What key action steps do you suggest our audience take away today if they are to turn their ambition to scale into reality? Kerry, we'll, we'll start with you for your final word and then me will go to you. Well, I could do a whole panel on that one, but I'll do, I've touched on value add, I've touched on reaching out, I've touched on uh, making sure you're doing your homework. One of the things I really think that founders should be doing is a four minute pitch, being able to do a four minute pitch, a three minute pitch as quickly as possible. So when you meet somebody, you can just deliver and refine your messaging really easily to them and practice your 25 minute Zoom pitch all the time. Um, and I think that you've just got to do this really, really all of the time. But my most important thing is do your homework on the VC and your partner that you're going to have alongside you for a long time. If I left you with anything this today, I think I've kind of said that quite a few times. Do your homework. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, you have, Kerry. And, and the point is extremely well made. And Neil, what's yours? I think the single thing I would say to anybody looking to raise capital at my end of the market is, is get advice. This is probably a once in a lifetime or once in a generation um, step that a business or a founder will, will make. Um, and so it's absolutely critical that you get advice from someone you trust and has been through this process before. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you both so much indeed. Um, I will be summarizing uh, so, uh, your, your points both on a short video again that would be shared afterwards as well as at the end of this conference. I know both Neil and Gary have to leave us now. Just want to say a huge thank you to you both. You've brought such really great insights and practical direction and you've absolutely walked the walk yourselves and we really appreciate your time. So before I now bring you to the last panel of our Ambition to Scale conference, a couple of things that I want to tell you about. Number one is just again to remind you that the hashtag is Ambition to Scale. I am watching it over here on Twitter all the time to make sure that I am catching just in case that there's any questions or any comments that people have. Number two is do please do keep your keep your comments and your questions coming through the panel. I'm I can it's over there on your right hand side. I will see it and the questions will come through here. And as you've been seeing, I will feed them directly across. Now, in addition, again, just like we mentioned this morning, there's a fantastic prize with Sherry Katu. So for those of you who are going to stay on with us right up until the end of the day, you will be in with that draw. Now, 
rather than ask you to uh, fill out another poll at this stage, I'll, I'll ask you about that again later on. But I do want to put something else to you. And that is a couple of things that people have said to us so far that I really want to drill down on. Number one, Sherry. Sherry spoke about the growth hack of bringing, you know, interns or bringing employ, um, bringing uh, MBAs or bringing students or people who are very close to who have just finished in university into your business. And do you remember when she said, just bust this open, right? Do you remember when she said that? Well, Intertrade Ireland actually have an opportunity where they will fund that for you, uh, or partly fund to fund that for you. And it's called it's called Fusion. So if you look up Intertrade Ireland's website and look at the Fusion opportunity in there, it's one that I have been promoting for a long, long time myself. Um, I've also, I've, I've worked in that area. I'm sorry, when I say worked in that area, I've brought people in on that basis. And when you when they bring in, you know, those great theoretical ideas that they learned in university or college or, or studying in a master's or PhD capacity, and they apply to a real scenario with that fresh, great enthusiasm where they're constantly in a position to, to earn or earn and learn at the same time. It can really, really work out well. The second thing that I want to say to you is a lot of the time so far today, we have been talking about internationalizing. Um, Stuart there mentioned about, you know, global ambition or also Neil mentioned about going into international markets and building relationships there and having the tools to do so. And also yesterday, Gary mentioned about, you know, landing in Sa San Francisco. I do also want to mention something to you about Invest Northern Ireland. I am the biggest fan of Enterprise Europe Network, which is an ecosystem of entre entrepreneurial bodies like Invest in I, but all over Europe and beyond that, all out into the world. And I seriously mean it. It was transformational for us when we started engaging with Enterprise Europe Network back in, oh, I think our first interaction with them was back in November 2010. Now, in order to get access to this, there's 250,000 business opportunities in there of companies who want to link in with other companies to scale, to, to be distributors, to co-apply for funding, to research together, etc. But you have to start somewhere. And where I suggest is Invest Northern Ireland. They are your local touch point to do that. And they can show you how to open up that ecosystem. Now, the third thing that I want to talk to you about before we introduce um, our next two panelists is also an opportunity run by British Business Bank that you will that you will have heard about when you came in, in the first place. So the Department of International Trade um, with the British Business Banks is offering pitching sessions with Roy Williamson, the Senior Venture Deal Flow Manager. Uh, now, this is typically into companies seeking to raise £4 million pounds plus. OK, now this is there also for founders who are seeking to connect with global and international investors. And it's organized and coordinated by the, by the British Business Bank. And we have to thank um, Paul Mars, who's also going to be on our next panel for also his help with this. Now, all of this is in the resources panel where you can learn about that or just simply reach out directly to the British Business Bank to find out about that. You see, the thing is, is that the three organizations, you know, the way it's typically someone like me, right? Someone like me who's hosting this conference is going to say, and thanks a million to them all for what they're doing. But the thing is, is that obviously I'm going to say that. Of course, I'm going to say that. They're the reason that we're all here today. But the thing is, is that they can make such a transformational difference. The impact of Intertrade Ireland and Invest Northern Ireland and the British Business Bank on all of our businesses and the lives and the livelihoods that we have and the staff that we have, the connections that we can make and the opportunities for us to take our ambition and scale it is really immense. When I'm talking to people, clients and, and organizations and people that I know in the States or other parts of the world where they don't have these types of ecosystems, they shake their heads with like, you know, how lucky we are and how fortunate we are to have them, but also the, the great platform that it is in order to move forward and to progress forward in the visions that we have. So make sure and reach out on any of those. So Fusion and Intertrade Ireland, Enterprise Europe Net Network through um, Invest Northern Ireland and the British Business Bank for those pitching sessions, as well as the plethora. Remember Mary McKenna said yesterday, Northern Ireland is awash with resources for, for companies and for startups and scale-ups, but we have to apply for them in order to make them, make them worthwhile for us. And then it's up to us then to tell the world about them accordingly. Okay, right. On that note, can I now bring in our next panel? And in this case, I am now going to introduce to you uh, two people who are full of passion and insight and also an awful lot of experience. So Paul Morris, and, and Hussein Nijab, you are both super, super welcome indeed. Uh, first of all, Hussein. Um, so this is Hussein Kanji from Hoxton, uh, from, sorry, from Hoxton Ventures. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about you and all about Hoxton, please? Yeah, uh, I'm an early stage venture capitalist based in London. Uh, we invest all across Europe in kind of the one to five million check size. 
and we try and find businesses that are in, in brand new market categories, as, as Carrie was saying before, where we think the business in Europe is likely to win globally and, and scale internationally. We like being the first check, and we were the seed investors in Deliveroo and Dark Trace, both of which went public uh, a few months ago, and uh, Babylon, which is planning on going public in a few months from, from now. Brilliant. Uh, so you like to write the first check. Great, Hussein. And can you just just tell us uh, round about how much might be on that check? Uh, we typically invest somewhere between a million and five um, okay. dollars yeah. or a euro, kind of all the same to us. Sure. OK, because I, I thought that was that was what I heard there a moment ago, but I just wanted to wanted to clarify dollars or euros. They're 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 all the same to you. Very good. Depending on the exchange rate, I'm sure. Uh, great. And now can I go to Paul Morris, Chief Investment Officer of Venture Capital at the Department of International Trade. Paul, will you tell us a little bit about you and the work that you do, please? Yeah. Hi, Susan. Good morning, everybody. Um, you know, about eight years ago, the UK government decided that it might be interesting to try and attract more venture capital to the UK. So they set up a specialist unit uh, that works to, on the one hand, identify and connect with VCs and corporate VCs around the world that have an interest in investing in the UK. And on the other hand, to identify UK startups um, that would be attractive to international investors. So I'm, I'm, I work, I advise that unit. I lead on the investor interactions globally. Um, I have a couple of other roles as well outside that uh, that are also VC related. Um, Global Corporate Venturing is an organization that, uh, that is basically a membership organization for corporate VCs globally. Um, it, it, uh, I've led the GCV Academy for the last three years. Um, that delivers interactive training workshops for corporates, for corporate VCs um, in Silicon Valley and New York and also in Europe and in Asia. Um, and that's actually been rolled into what is now the GCV Institute, uh, reflecting the fact that it's been impossible for the last 18 months to do face-to-face -face things. And um, before all that, I, uh, most of my career, almost 30 years, I worked with uh, Dow Chemical, um, and I set up Dow's corporate VC unit in Europe, and, and uh, that was back in 1996, and ran that for uh, uh, around 15 years, making both, by both direct investments and uh, taking LP positions in funds. And as they say, Paul, and what do you do in your free time? <laughs> so, so, so on that note, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to now share the results with you of the most recent poll. Now, this poll we ran just after Stuart and just before Kerry and Neil. And the question was, have you ever considered or explored the possibility of raising equity finance before? Now, 27% of people here today, sorry, 27% of people who answered the poll, I need to be specific on that, has given this no consideration. Now, 41% have said considered but not yet applied. 5% said applied but not yet successful. And 27% have raised equity. So, Hussein, can I go to you first? What's your reaction to that, to, the, to those numbers? Not, not surprising. I think, it, uh, you know, these kinds of audiences um, can be really broad. And, and I, I think equity equity, at least venture expensive, can be incredibly expensive uh, for, for a company that's not going through going, going to go through hyperscale uh, because venture people look for these extreme returns. You know, if you can bootstrap your business uh, and never have to look for equity financing and no reason to share your equity if you don't need to, that works really well. If you're building a business and you can get a bank loan of some kind or you can, you can finance it with debt, that also makes a lot of sense. You know, you see an increasing amount of bootstrapped uh, businesses where the founders are able to actually build something to, to real scale. Uh, I think last week there was a company that raised a $543 million Series A, and that seemed like an outrageous number until you realize the founders had completely built a business from scratch and, and taken it to $100 million a year in revenue. Um, and the 543 was a chance for the investors to kind of buy some shares in that business on a secondary basis, it wasn't really money going into the into the company. So, so you can do these things without necessarily raising venture. And then, if you're going to raise equity capital for a kind of a scale up type business, a, a tech business, then then venture can be a huge accelerant, uh, and, and that's kind of what we have to look for. But Hussein, you just mentioned there that there's increasing amounts of bootstrapping. Why do you think that is? Is it access to um, non equity capital? Is it because business models can support that? Is it grant? Um, is it culture? Why do you think there's an increasing amount of bootstrapping going on? So a couple, a couple of things that happen, and, and we see it now in the public markets and we see it in the private markets, the, the scale and depth of the tech markets today 
is at an all-time high level, right? Technology touches so much of the world today, even compared to like 20 years ago, where we thought technology was going to touch lots, lots of the economy. You know, today you actually see it. And, and, you know, you have a population that's online that's a well north of four or five billion you know, people. So, you know, you can actually reach people who are using your product or your service, you know, in a way today that you just couldn't in the past. And so you have this, you have this scale effect in terms of the market's really quite big and it's actually quite accessible, right? If you put a service up on the internet, you put a service up on the app store, you can actually get people to use it. And then at the same time, the cost of building these things have actually come dramatically down. So, you know, there was a time where you could not build a website or a web service of any kind without raising 20, 30, 40 million dollars. You know, today you can do that you know, in, in your own room using tools and kind of build your own your, your own little code base and, and kind of ship it on the app store. And, and so, you know, if you can do all these things, you know, there's no reason to share with people like me, you know, if you can actually build it. Now, most of the time you can't do it without actually having some resources in the bank, but every once in a while, and I think increasingly every once in a while, you can actually build these businesses up. And, you know, this one that we read about last week was incredible, right? To go, to go from zero to a hundred million in revenue without ever, Ever raising, you know, raising a cent of capital, whether it was debt or equity, is is a remarkable achievement. And, and you're seeing this because of these two kind of mega trends, right? Markets are big, they're accessible, and the costs are low. Markets are big and the costs are low. Well, what would be your response to that, Paul, as well as the answer to our poll, which is that, I mean, again, just to pick out the biggest number here is that 41% of the people who answered this question said, they have considered but not yet applied for raising equity finance. What's your experience and reaction to that? Yeah, I, I think you said, uh, Susan, that 25 or 27% hadn't even considered it. 27%, think, correct. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody should at least consider it and you, you need to understand what the pros and cons are. I mean, why do I want to give up uh, some of my business to share in my business to somebody I don't even know yet? Um, it, it's. I think it's, it's a question that, um, in order to, to find the right answer, you really need to understand what, what, is the, what is the growth plan for the business? Where do I want to be? Where do I want to get this to? And if I can fund it other ways, you know, people typically, typically start with friends and family, whatever, uh, you know, maybe I can get to a certain point. But if, if I really want to make this, you know, a large successful business, do I want to accelerate my growth? Maybe I should consider uh, taking equity finance. So I give up a share in my business to one or more external investors, but you know, I get in, in return for that, I get capital that may allow me to deliver things that I couldn't deliver otherwise. And I think perhaps just one other consideration is, uh, you know, good VCs and corporate VCs bring more than just capital. They bring guidance. They bring, uh, you know, they bring contacts, and so they can they they basically go on a journey with you together. And uh, you know they, they so you know you, you they may they may ha actually help you accelerate the growth of the business not just with the capital but with ideas and contacts and other things. Paul, that term you used there, you said to give up part of your business. Do do you think is is that really the is that you know the, the phrase to give up sounds like you're you're giving it away? I mean, in essence, I really like the fact, and I mean, Kerry in particular was pointing out about the journey together, the found founding connection. Should we not think? Of, or sorry, sh should we stop thinking that equity finance is giving away something, but more so that it is, uh, you know, it's a transfer, it's a transaction, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, the, the, the sum of the, the sum of the parts is greater than the individual pieces themselves. Is, is, have we got the wrong connotation around that? Yeah, actually, it's a great point because I, I'm, I'm using that terminology because I think that's what I've heard entrepreneurs say. They see this as giving up part of their yeah. business. And of course, if you own 100% of your business or you and you and your group, your founders group, and then you bring in external investors, you are giving up part of the shareholding. But I, I think you're right that, that you've got to look at what am I getting, you know, what am I, what am I um, giving in terms of uh, um, letting somebody else come into the business and take a share of the business and what am I getting in return? And I think one way to look at it, you, you might think is, you know, what do I want in, you know, five, 10 years time, to have, um, you know, I don't know what the right metaphor is, you know, to, to have a nice small plain bun that I own myself, or do I want some huge, beautiful black forest gatto where I only own 10% of it, but, you know, 10% is still worth more than my small plain bun. So you know, choose your metaphor, but, uh, but I think, you know, that, and, and ultimately you've got to decide the, the right answer is going to be the one that you eventually, uh, you know, find 
and talking to as many people as you can to decide when and how I will raise finance for my business, you know, that's the way you've got to progress. And obviously the very fact that people are giving up some of probably what's a very busy Thursday and Friday to be here uh, shows us the, o- the open-mindedness for that. Um, Hussein, can I, can I go to you next? Because we have been very focused on here, here in Northern Ireland, you know, looking internally, I asked Kerry and I asked Neil as well, what it was like to invest here, but can we now go a little bit outside? How do or should approaches differ when dealing with UK specific, like whether it's, oh no, sorry, of course, when I, I should be specific about that, let's say London-based funds or US-based funds, whether it's East Coast or West Coast or other international investors, how should the approach differ, Hussein, in your opinion? Well, I think the approach is largely the same. So most most of us work off of kind of a reference basis. So we like hearing about a company from people that we kind of already trust within our within our circles. Now, the exceptions to this are if you build a business and you take it to 100 million in revenue, right? Kind of that that the evidence kind of speaks for itself that the company is exceptional. But a lot of times you hear about ex- people who, who are exceptional much earlier in their journey, and you hear about the fact that they are exceptional from people kind of in your extended network. So the goal is, I think, when you're in any kind of region. If you're, say, targeting, you know, kind of from Northern Ireland into, into California, how do you get the California community to recognize that there's something special happening with a particular company in Northern Ireland? The easiest way is if, if, if there are people who they talk to who might know a little bit about Northern Ireland, if they, if they mention that this is a fast rising company or it's a super high potential company or just an incredible set of people kind of behind the company, right? you, you kind of have to make the light bulb go off for them to kind of come and, and do the work and kind of kind of leave the Bay Area to some degree, right? Because you have a pretty closed mindset sometimes when you're in the Bay Area because you're surrounded by people. And the same is true true in London. In London. You, you can go knock on the door blindly at any one of these firms. I remember an old friend of mine who, who, who's now since built a, a billion dollar business. When he was done setting up that particular business like 20 years ago, he went and printed out the business plan and then went and mailed it to every single one of the VCs. And, and lo and behold, nobody ever really opened up the envelope and looked at the business plan and, and rather than the check in that a bootstrapping it, it himself and took it to 250 million in revenue himself but you know so he's very very successful but you know everyone ignored him because he was born in venezuela was kind of out of the system you know how was how was anyone going to get how was anyone going to know that he was a fast rising star so you have to get people who are kind of in these inner circles uh, and then the question is how do you engineer that right and you know, if you're ever a hacker uh, and you're trying to do something malicious, right, there's a term called social engineering, which is, you know, that's how you, you follow someone into the building, right, to, to be able to get access to a computer. You've got to, as a founder, think about how do you socially engineer, right? You look at the LinkedIn, you look at who people are connected to, you find the commonalities in between, and you go one, one-to-one. Sorry, Bottle. And uh, go ahead, Paul. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, Hussein made some great points. I just wanted to add, you know, that in terms of, you know, looking at the international investors, you know, if you're if you're a startup in Northern Ireland, um, there are local funds that you could approach and look for funding. If you look at the whole of the UK, you've got a bigger pool, but actually there's a much much bigger pool, which is the whole international pool. And although the UK has done very well in the last few years in terms of raising VC. Um, the UK, it, it, when you look at Europe, uh, the UK total VC investment in the UK is over a third of the total in Europe, and it's more than France and Germany combined. But still, you know, if last year I think UK was in round numbers about fifteen billion dollars, and the total global investment was something around two hundred and fifty billion, depending on the data source. So there's there's many many international investors uh, that I think you could look at, and uh, you know that this is what we do at DIT is, is to try and connect. Uh, startups with international investors so you know do do keep your mind open to what they can bring apart from just capital again local connections and maybe helping developing your businesses in the countries where they are based and if i could if i could take hussein's point there about you know the, the social engineering and so on how important do you think a warm lead or introduction is paul oh um you know Deal flow is is something that's you know pretty common. You you talk to an average size fund and they'll say, you know, we see a thousand deals a year or whatever. Um, but you know, filtered, high quality, relevant deal flow, I think, is very valuable for any investor. And indeed, when you know when when uh, when GPs are looking to raise another fund, they'll often in their presentation they'll include their access to propriety deal flow, good quality deal flow, etc. So I think. If you can get as an entrepreneur an introduction, a warm lead, 
to an uh, to an investor, uh, that counts is, is much more likely to at least get their attention. Now you've still got to then sell your story. You've got to tell the story, but you know get, getting the opportunity to tell your story is is you know that that is important. And again, that's that's what we're doing at DIT. We work with you know we work with about three hundred investors around the world. Um, these are people, some people that we've got to know recently, but others that we've known for years and years. And when we make an introduction, uh, we, you know, we 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 let the um, the on, the entrepreneur know that this is a firm we've known for a long time. We've developed a relationship with them so that when we send pre-screen deal flow to one of those uh, investors, uh, they at least have a look at it because um, you know we, we've built up a uh, you know a, a relationship over time. So I think I think it's really important. So I'd encourage anybody that's listening to try and develop your network of contacts, those people that can help bring you into, you know, it, to, to people that might make a warm introduction. And it's, again, it's human nature. You know, I could tell you that what we do at DIT, whether you're an entrepreneur or an investor is, is a great service and you could you should avail yourself of that service. But of course, I'm gonna say that answer because I'm, I'm hardly neutral. But if you're, if you're, if you know Hussein very well, and he gives me a warm introduction to you, that, that counts for a lot more. So I think it's really, really important. And this it sounds like, sounds like a big industry, but actually it's not, it's a relatively small community and uh, you know, do develop those networks. And Hussein, Paul says about getting an opportunity to tell your story. And what I'm also wondering, and I'm sure the audience is wondering is what should you also not tell or what should you not say? Like what are the, what are the pitfalls that you need to avoid when you do get that warm introduction or that social engineer lead? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to keep your story pretty tight. Everyone's running around doing a thousand things at the same time. And if you get into every little, you know, small thing that's inside the business and can't kind of surface up, you know, to the 10, 20,000 foot level, it's tough. And then, you know, the biggest challenge that we've made, most people go through kind of pitch training, right, before they go to a venture person or, or raise equity financing, they kind of do their rehearsals, et cetera. We've all, we've all kind of seen this. I think the other thing is you have to, you have to, as a venture person, you're, you're really looking for these, companies that can become very large, very distinctive, you know, very global uh, in, in many ways. You're not just looking for, you're not a financier to finance kind of a small business. It's, it's hard to make money in venture doing that. And so the other thing that we often see is people talk about the business and the here and now, but they don't explain kind of the big vision of where this could actually fit into the wider ecosystem and how it could scale up. And you almost have to, you have to suspend disbelief when you're writing these kinds of checks into entrepreneurs. Um, you know, you have to believe in the possibility of what could actually happen if all the pieces kind of went right. And you know, most of the time they're not going to go right. But it's really hard for a venture person who's kind of a trained cynic in many ways uh, to find holes in things to, to be the optimist, right? So you kind of need the entrepreneur to kind of paint the picture and paint the vision and explain how this could become really big. Now, there are some people who did incredibly well doing this and never kind of delivered the WeWork story as a good example and a poster child, so it can be too far into the excess. But, but you do need to paint this. The, the reason why they raise so much money is that founder is very charismatic and is able to paint this significantly big, you know, bigger picture than just kind of a real estate leasing company, which is at the end of the day what kind of WeWork really was. What can you tell us from the other side of the table is that is you know, that focus on risk? I mean, Hussein, you say there, you know, you have to suspend belief when you're writing checks into these entrepreneurs. And then you also say, you know, you know that sometimes it's not going to go right. What's your appetite and attitude to risk then on the downside? Because obviously you want the upside that like that's why you're investing. But what's your view on the downside? Yeah, we, I mean, we all run portfolios for a reason. So we don't expect every single one of our companies to, to deliver these kinds of returns. I mean, it would be great if every single one of our investments was a delivery or a dark trace, but that's just not realistic. I mean, in, in our kind of industry and, and the payouts, you know, if we were the first investor in these kinds of companies, you know, you're talking about 100x, 200x, 300x type returns on, on, the, on the dollar that you're putting in or on the pound that you're putting in. So, you know, the payouts are really big, which means that if you, if you fail 20 times in a row, before you get a 300 times payout, you're actually still doing pretty well, um, you know, as, a, as an investor. So, so you're looking for these very asymmetric bets, um, you know, things that can, if they, if they, if they work, they really pay off. And the worst that happens, and it sounds really bad, but the worst that happens is you lose your money. And it's not the end of the world. If, you, if you're getting paid 300 on one and you're losing 19 because you lost a dollar every single time, 19 times in a row, as a 20th time that pay, pays a 300, you know, 300 divided by 20 is still a pretty darn good return uh, as a venture person. So you, you need these businesses when they win to, to win really big. And 
you don't worry so much about what happens when they don't go so well. Now, obviously, none of us like losing, none of us like failing. So we work like hell to make sure that all of our businesses succeed. So you know, that's when you inject a bunch of time, energy, resources, et cetera, to make sure you get every advantage possible. But, but when, it, when you win, it, it wins really big, and that kind of covers up all your sins. Covers up all your sins. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way of putting it, Hussein. Paul, you know, Hussein there talks about having to paint the vision. You know, is that you need, if you're dealing with a cynical VC, you need to be able to paint the vision. So, and then of course, Ker- Kerry also mentioned earlier on this morning that it's important to have, you know, your four minute pitch down. Hussein there says, keep it tight. So what needs to be in there? Let's assume nobody here in the room has done pitch training. So what exactly do you need to have in there? What are the key elements? What do you need to hear if I'm going to pitch to you and, and get your attention? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd absolutely reinforce the message that, you know, Hussein just gave about, you know, there's a value in brevity, at least when you first make that contact and, and Kerry made that point as well. I, I always remember some sort of grizzled old VC in Silicon Valley saying about uh, uh, the CEO of one of the companies that he'd invested in. He said, you know, I ask him for the time and he tells me how to build a watch. So, you know, the, the point so the point was, you know, try and, try and be brief and concise. So, you know, what, what, what would you put in? Well, when we, when we try and um, first attract the attention uh, of an investor to a company that we'd, we'd like them to have a look at, um, what, what we like to put together is, you know, six or eight sort of single line, simple bullet points that says, what does the company do? You know, two or three one line points about what's unique and valuable and exciting about this company, uh, what stage are they at at the moment? How much are they raising? Um, maybe is there anything significant, notable about the management? You know, particularly for managements, uh, you know, had some successes before, or even you know, had two or three companies before. Maybe you know, one's been a good success and one's been a failure, but you, you learn from those failures as well. Um, and then maybe also to that, if we're sending this by email, we'd attach a you know a one-page teaser or something that gives a little bit more information. You know, because remember, you know, if you're sending this by email, at least under normal circumstances, people are reading it on a phone or a busy train or something, and you need to capture their attention in the first 20 seconds or so. So, so I think the, the only purpose then, whether, whether it was us doing it as DIT or you're doing it as an entrepreneur directly, is to get the attention of the investor and get them to agree, okay, I'd like to have a call. I'd like to learn more about this. And then, you know, when you get on the call, you begin to... You know, explain what the company's about, but don't, you know, don't get too far in into the technical detail. You know, what problem are you solving? You know, how are you solving it, and why is it, why is your solution better than anybody else? And and what's the size of the problem? You know, how big could this company be? And what you want to do is just you know make some bold statements, but you know, don't make it sound like it's been written by the marketing department. Um, and then get the investor to begin to ask questions because they're interested to probe deeper. And I think that that sort of approach works pretty well. So be concise, get straight to the point, and specifically, what is the problem? How are you solving it? And how big is the market? And with the view that the whole intention of this is simply getting the attention of the investor with the view to have, having a call afterwards. And I, th- I think that that's, that's a key message that, that many of you have spoken about, but it's really, you know, the way you've whittled it right down there, Paul, is, is very, very helpful. Okay, so then what I'm also going to do then is I'm just going to ask you both, how much should one offer in different rounds? So how does one strike the balance between being interesting enough but, uh, to invest in, but, sco- but still offer scope to raise more money in the future? How do we strike that balance? Hussein, let's, let's go to you there first. Yeah, I mean, you, usually the rule of thumb is you need, you need enough money and kind of enough fuel in the tank to kind of go for 12 to 18 months. That's usually when there's kind of a value creating milestone where the business is materially different, where someone else might want to invest. And, you know, historically, I would have said, you know, that first round is somewhere between one to five. That second round is somewhere between, you know, five to 20, maybe five to 15. And that third round is kind of, you know, 25 to 50. But these days, capital is really cheap. And a lot of people are investing really aggressively and it's not unusual sometimes for that first round to be 10. It's not unusual for that second round to be 50. It's not unusual for that third round to be 100. And in all of those cases, you know, as long as you have enough money in the tank to get to kind of a value creating milestone, like if the, the business materially looks different, that's good. And, and the danger with raising sometimes too much money is, you know, if someone gives you $50 million, they're, they're gonna value the business maybe at like 150 or 200. 
you know, the next time you decide to raise capital, you kind of want to see at least a three X in between rounds in terms of in terms of the, this value creeping events, um, which means that you have to raise at a six hundred million dollar valuation. The kinds of questions that you get when you're a twenty million company are very different than when you're a two hundred million company, are very different than when you're a six hundred million dollar company, and so you know you have to think carefully about maybe not raising too much, only for the sense that if you have enough for what you need, you want to make sure that the next time you're raising money, your price is not so inflated or not so high that you don't you're 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 setting yourself up for a kind of failure. No one's going to write the next check because it's impossible for you to deliver what you kind of need to do. But you know right now. If you have a good idea, there's a lot of money out there, and there's a lot of money that wants to go put to work in this kind of business. You know, people people are very excited about tech, so it's actually really quite easy to raise a little bit more than what you want. So three x in between rounds is the key metric I'm taking out of, out of that, Hussein. Paul, do you want to just maybe share any insights on that specifically around keeping people interested in between rounds? Yeah, I mean, I I, I absolutely I think agree with what Hussein just said. But I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking at you know, the more I raise, the more of the company I'm selling uh, at a valuation that is today. And I am hoping that I'm going to hit milestones, which will allow me to raise the next round at a higher valuation. But there's always that that trade off. Um, but I think an important consideration is, you know, from an investor point of view, um, fundraising can be very time consuming and it detracts the attention of the CEO and the senior management. You know, if, if I'm an investor in the company, I want the management to be focused on taking the company forward and delivering on its business plan. Um, now, fundraising is a necessary distraction from time to time, but you don't want it to happen too often. So, you know, I, I always like to see companies raise, you know, money to cover at least 18 months, you know, if not two years, because, you know, fundraising, you know, you, you, you want to leave yourself, I think, six months to raise the funding. Now, as Hussein just mentioned, at the moment, the climate is very positive and there's a lot of VC capital out there. But we don't know what's around the corner. You know, if you were trying to raise money, if you were talking in 2000, you didn't see what was going to happen in 2001. If you're talking in 2000, early 2008, you didn't realize how difficult it was going to be in 2009. So, so you know, my, my experience of companies is if I look at the ones that maybe could have raised more but didn't, and the ones that think in retrospect they raised more than they should have done, there's a lot more in the former category that wish they'd have raised more when they could have done than the ones that look back and say, you know, maybe we raised too much. So, you know, look at, look at what your milestones are, what you need to deliver and raise, raise the capital that you can to, to get you to some really significant milestones. And as I bring this, this conversation um, to a close, I just want to finish with the last question that I had also asked to the other, to Kerry and Neil as well, which is, you know, Paul there talks about knowing your milestones and, and raising capital accordingly. What key action steps do you suggest our audience take today if they want to turn their ambition to scale into reality? Uh, I'm going, sorry, I'm going to go to Paul first. <laughs> right, okay. You're both being very polite there. <laughs> We're both very polite, is he? <laughs> um, yeah, I would see. I would say, in your mind, know where do you want to be. You know, where do you want to be in two years, in five years' time? So you start with a vision. Then you have your business plan. You know, have, have a well-written business plan, and then you have your strategy. You know, how are you going to deliver on on what you want to do in the business plan? And funding is part of that strategy. Uh, so, what funding do I need to achieve? what I want to achieve in order to deliver on my, on my ambition here for the company. And uh, you know, that, that will help you determine uh, what, what you need to do in terms of funding. So have a clear plan and then try and bring people with you along that journey. And the, the people you need to bring along are your, you know, your team, your investors and your, and your customers. Um, you know, and you know, we haven't talked much about management teams, but I think ultimately investors you, you, yes, you technically you invest in a company, but really you're investing in a team. So the importance of building a great team around you, if you're the founder, is is really important. And we we spoke a lot actually about accelerators and the way in which they bring teams along. Yesterday, Paul, for sure, but it's it's a point very well made. Hussein, your your final word on this. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would echo a lot of what, what what Paul just said, and I would say, you know, if you know where you want to be in five years, and you and you know that you want to raise venture, uh, which is again not for everybody, because not all businesses are going to go through this hyperscale. So there's no point in giving away 20, 30, 40 percent of your business over time to someone if you're not going to be one of those exceptional type businesses that that deserve like where you want to split the pie that way, because the pie gets bigger for everybody. But if, if ventures definitely want to do, and and then you're not super well connected in the ecosystem. I would spend the time and energy, A, thinking about where you want to be when you when, when the business kind of grows up, and then making sure you get as embedded in the industry that you build those relationships. This is a very relationship-oriented industry. It, it's a very large industry, and it feels like it's inaccessible. It is also, it's extremely open. And so, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's a quirk uh, of the tech industry. None of us know where the next big thing is going to come from. None of us know what kid is going to kind of walk through the door in their pajamas and, and build a trillion dollar business. Uh, we, we just don't know. And as a result, we're very humbled by these things. So we keep a very open mind because yeah, we're not that smart. We don't know what the future really looks like. It's the people who are building the businesses that are the smart ones in the room. Um, but as a result, the industry is just very, very, very well connected because people keep a very open mind. So it's actually very easy to kind of embed yourself in the community. The more you're embedded in the community, the easier it is to kind of, you know, for people to do kind of the social referencing and the, and the kind of the warm, the, the warm kind of back channel type stuff behind the scenes, the easier it is to write you the $10 million check if it's someone who looks like they're going to be capable of actually then spending the $10 million effectively. So I would, I would use that time and energy while you're figuring it out to make sure you get embedded into the, in, into the system. Well, I think the anal oh, sorry, the vision of the kid walking through the door in his pajamas building his trillion dollar company is one that will last certainly insane. But your point again is very well made about spending time and energy getting embedded into the industry because as Kerry mentioned earlier, people often don't do this once but many times and they get better and the, the, the effect gets compounded. Thank you both sincerely. You've been really, really insightful very honest and authentic and very entertaining I have to say as well on the part of you both I've really enjoyed meeting you and getting to know you and I really appreciate all the part of what you've shared with us and we wish you every success in the future so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you through the last part of our conversation over the next couple of minutes and again we're going to lead up today to be finishing it with the with the draw with the, the closing draw so I have a couple of things to do first and foremost can I ask the team back at HQ to please run our polls again? Because we're going to do this just like we did yesterday. And let's see how things have changed. So we're going to run the first two polls, which is how aware are you now of the range of alternative or non-bank um, funding, uh, funding options available to scaling businesses? And also, can I also ask the question is how important do you think equity or alternative finance is when it comes to scaling your business? Okay, so let's just run those polls. And uh, as soon as they go live, I am going to uh, just going to be able to count down the clock for you. OK, and we will just wait for those to go live now in. OK, there we go. And I see now we have we're about 10 seconds in. Mm. OK, do you know what? Sometimes when I'm watching these in the background, it's like watching horses run a race. So we have got 16 seconds and I'm just going to just going to wait and see there. Just want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to get across their points of view. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the difference between what you said this morning and what you're saying right now. OK, so we have now been running this poll for uh, 38 seconds. So I'm just going to give this five, four, three, two, one. Okay, right. So again, I know your time is very valuable here. So I'm just going to make sure that, that we get through these now uh, pretty, uh, pretty quickly. So first of all, this morning, 32% of you said that you had good awareness of the range of alternative or non bike uh, options available. That has now increased to 39%. And also, uh, there was 53% of you this morning said you had some awareness. That has now increased to 56%. So overall, if I join those two together, this morning, it was 85% of you had either some, 84% uh, had either some awareness or good awareness. And that has now increased to... Um, 95% of you, 94% of you, an increase of 10 percentage points there on the awareness level. Really, really happy to see that. And in, and that, of course, is in great credit to our panelists. The second question then we asked you was, how important do you think equity or alternative finance is when it comes to scaling your business? Do you know what? This is the first time it's happened. 
it's exactly the same. Is still two out of every three of you feel that it is very important. And indeed, of course, like I had mentioned just there too, to Paul and Hussein, it is likely that we would have a very high number of people there. So it's interesting that you're still of that mindset, which is great. And long may that continue and it may it turn into action. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you one more question. And this is the same as yesterday. We're going to ask you what action will you take as a result of attending this conference. And then I'm going to give you some actions, right, that, that I think might be might be helpful after that. So can I just ask again the team, will you please launch their final poll of the Ambition to Scale conference? Thank you. OK, and this this is not so much a poll, it's more a question. So what action will you take as a result of attending this conference? Let's just hear what you have to say. And we're really, really interested to hear this. Okay, so we have at the moment, we have just looking here at the numbers in comparison, round about half of the people here have, round about half of you have answered this, but I just want to give you, because we are just about 15 seconds in, I am going to give you about another 20 seconds in this. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, that's super. And I will now tell you that um, only five percent of you, five percent of you, have said none but better informed. 84% of you are saying that you're now going to go and find out more information. And to that 84%, there is a resources section up there at the top right. You'll be able to see it up there. There is a resources section there with all of the various different details um, regarding the various different resources that you can take in, uh, or, or in follow up from here. So that's certainly where I would suggest that you go. And do you know what's really wonderful here is 11% of you have now said that you are going to go and apply for equities, which is fantastic. That's really, really super to see. OK, brilliant. Really, really, really happy to hear that. And this is what Ambition to Scale has been all about is how do we enable people to get that ambition to turn from, from an ambition into reality as they move on their scale journey. Okay, super. Now, um, I also now, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I have learned from our three different panels. Uh, I've already, as I mentioned, put together a summary that is up on LinkedIn on the various different people that I mentioned earlier on. They're all, um, they're all available on the Invest in I LinkedIn, on Susan Nightingale's page on LinkedIn, and also on Paul, um, Patrick Durer's uh, Dewar's, um, LinkedIn page as well. You can see that summary of yesterday's event has all been there. But before, uh, before we finish with you today, what I'd like to do is also to take you through what is taking place or what, what, ha what I've learned from the various different people so far. Okay, first of all, let's go to yesterday's panel. Um, Gary spoke about the importance of the peer to peer network that he says we can move forward, but we have to do it together. He, he spoke about their um, their scaling um, accelerator, which is a six month for an executive team and founder. And also then the application process, he said there is one and it's more about the, that founder connection, like Kerry mentioned, where and also they take on about two to three companies a year in Northern Ireland and they're hungry to find them. He said it's important to be, meet people in person. It's really key to build deep relationships. And you have to give first rather than think about what's in it for me. In the in the pre-COVID world, it was all about getting out there. And he said how, uh, and it will be again. And also Tech Nation have, has a Slack group where you can network with founders. Mary then spoke from Awaken Up, spoke about that they had welcomed their thousandth women uh, last month to Awaken Up. And they're very, very open and welcoming to many more. She said Northern Ireland is awash with resources for founders all over. And uh, she also said that it's a key task of a founder is to go out and to find resources for, for your company. Showed us the story of her coach where she went to that first networking event and inadvertently she ended up meeting the co-founder of Awaken Hub, Sinead Crowley, uh, on that very night. And she came home with her pocket, as she said, full of business cards. She spoke also about the importance of reputational capital with social capital is to take care to build and maintain and preserve your reputation as you go along. And she said, and I quote, a support network is the foundation of business. Then Elaine Smith from Catalyst, she recommended The Disciplined Entrepreneur as a book. She spoke about the importance of international support at Catalyst, and she says they offer exposure to world 
class input. She said they have, uh, they do ask for a financial commitment of up to £2,000. And that also involves a week long attendance at an EDP, an executive development program at MIT. Uh, they also have workshops around about one or two a month. And also there's coffee meetups and so on like that. She said, you have to show evidence that there is an opportunity of solving a problem and the customers are willing to pay. She said, if people, namely investors, see the potential and drive the ambition, then you will attract the talent and funding. And then Kerry Baldwin, she today said it's all around having a bold connection, founder, bold ambition and founder connection. She said what you need to do is make sure, and she said it a million times, do, do, do your homework, find out what is suitable, make sure your partner understands your sector and understands your problems and can actually add value to overcome them. She said, make sure and look out for the non-monetary benefits. For example, they match portfolio companies to offer that peer-to-peer -peer network. She said, ask for references of your potential investor and ask people, do they unlock value? Do they make customer introductions, etc." She spoke about the benefit of Northern Ireland having strong university tech, good grant system, and also the importance of corporate research and development investments. She said, you need to be comfortable interacting with others remotely. The world has become that way now. And Northern Ireland needs to bring in more outside in, in, uh, mentors, which to the great credit of British Business Bank, Invest Northern Ireland and Intertrade Ireland, they have done today as well by bringing international expertise into our conversation. She said, seed is all about selling the vision. By series A, you need to show how you can have repeatable sales and, and product market fit. But series B is about metrics, sales playbooks and understanding your market globally. She said, you need to attract your team better than you and lead it. You need not just confidence in yourself, but to instill a culture of confidence across the board. She said, founder connection deals especially with overcoming equity aversion and that you have to trust that you have the right people by your side. She questioned, is the vintage aligned to your fund? Is the vintage of your fund aligned to your vision? And she said, make sure that um, not to sell out too early and practice your four minute pitch. Neil then, he focuses on earnings positive, EBITDA over a million, and also um, people who are interested in raising between five and 20 million. He, in response to the poll, he said the direction of travel is what's more important than the numbers today. And he spoke about the importance of events like this. Diversity of capital is important, he said, and the availability of different funding is growing, both in nuance and in amount. He said often there is no lack of ambition, but there is the confidence lacking or also the tools to do it. And that is where an investor can really come in. He, regarding the aversion I put to him, he said, you have, if you're worried about selling that, or if you're worried about a business, selling a business out from under you, um, that you need to really talk to them, do your homework beforehand. And he said, always ask the question, what is the investor like on a cold, wet Monday morning after the results that didn't quite live up to expectations on Friday? He dealt with family business and he says in the case of family businesses that yes, money will transfer from one generation to the other, um, but also investing or an investor can help with that. He said ESG is of growing importance and whatever you do, go and get advice. And then finally, Paul said, you should always consider equity. There's always ways to get to a certain point, uh, but maybe equity can accelerate your progress and to find capital to do what you can't do otherwise. He said, get the opportunity to tell your story. That should be the objective of an email. And also, and I quote, he said, there is value in brevity. Remember he told the story. He said, he talks about an investor who says, I asked somebody to tell me the time. He showed me how to build a watch. Just remember that is that we have to, when we're seeking out equity or seeking out these opportunities, answer the question you're being asked with brevity. He wants to know in a pitch, what does it do? Is it, how is it unique and exciting? How is the size of the market and how are you going to go after it? He said, look at your milestones over the next two years to five years, particularly fundraising over 18 months to two years. And again, he also made the point and the voice of experience was speaking here when he said in 2000, people didn't know how difficult 2001 would be. In 2008, they didn't know how difficult 2009 would be. And we've all lived through 2020. So I think that that point was well made as well. Finally, then with Hussein, he said there is increasing amounts of bootstrapping, but he said the scale and the depth of the tech market has made that the market is big and costs are low. There's lots of money out there. He said, if you have a good idea, it's about making the connection and going for it. He said, it would be really great if a company can hear about you before you go to them. He said, particularly, they're looking for fast rising companies with incredible um, per, uh, prospects. In addition, he said, keep your pitch tight and go through pitch training beforehand. In addition, he said that investors have to suspend belief when writing checks, but it's up to you and to me as the founders, as creating the vision, let the investor be cynical and be able to answer those questions. 
He said, uh, we all run a portfolio for a reason. The payouts are big, they're asymmetric bets. When they win, they win big. They understand nobody likes losing, but sometimes it has to be done. He gave a metric of about 3x in between rounds. And then finally, he said, spend time and energy getting embedded into the industry. So that has basically been the, the panelists. If I had if I had continued, I could also do that as well for the keynotes and for Stuart. But again, you'd, you'd be here for, for a lot longer if I was to do that. So in essence, um, this now brings me to the end of our conversation today. I have absolutely and thoroughly enjoyed working with you. I've really, really enjoyed working with the team. They have been phenomenal in terms of every single thing that, that they have done. But the most important thing of all, of course, is you, is thanking you so much indeed for being here. We really hope that you take all of what you have learned and all of the action points that you could have learned throughout here and you turn those into action.